Let's talk about Bohr's atomic model. Get out your science notebook. Let's write the essential question. How do we draw Bohr models for any atom? Before we get into that, let's review what we know so far about atoms and their subatomic particles. Starting with the protons in the center of an atom, also called the nucleus, protons are responsible to give the atom its identity. Protons also provide positive charge to the atom and contribute to the mass being in the nucleus. Also part of the nucleus are the neutrons. Now neutrons act like glue to stabilize those protons, and they could do that because they do not have a charge. Neutrons stemming from the word neutral. Neutrons also being part of the nucleus do contribute to the overall mass as well. Now outside of the nucleus are these electrons, part of the electron cloud. Now electrons manipulate the charge of an atom. Now they're negatively charged, but they counteract the proton's positive charge. Now electrons have very little mass, therefore we don't really even count them as part of the overall mass of an atom. Now before we move on, I want to talk about this model of an atom and how actually it's not the best model. It's one we see often, but it's overly simplified. And we know that because of this man, Niels Bohr, and he overall didn't like this model of an atom. Now, if you think about that, he says, the center of the atom is positively charged, protons giving that positive charge, neutrons being neutral. The outer part of the atom is negatively charged from those electrons. If this is all there was, technically those two positive and negative pieces should spiral into each other and cancel out, causing the atom to cease to be. Now, Bohr had a better model. Through a series of math and other research, he was able to figure out these key ideas. The first being that electrons have to stay in specific energy level orbits. He even said that electrons couldn't exist anywhere between those orbits, like maybe a planet would, uh, but they have to exist on specific orbits. Now, electrons on the farther away orbits, the ones farther away from the nucleus, have higher energy than the ones closest to the nucleus. He did say that electrons could jump energy levels, and they do this by either absorbing or releasing energy. And you can kind of see that here with a little squiggly green line. Now, that energy, when it absorbs, causes the electron to jump to high energy levels, and then the electron can release energy to go back to a lower energy level. And this is really, really cool. They knew this because if you look at the spectrum of light that many elements emit when they're excited with electricity, they see that there are certain wavelengths of energy that are emitted by certain elements, and that is caused by these electron jumps. There's so many different types of Bohr models, and the variation in these Bohr models show why a lot of these elements emit certain frequencies or certain spectrum of visible light. In fact, this is how we know what stars are made out of. We know that stars have certain elements in them, like hydrogen or helium, because of the emitted light from them. And if we know the signature, the specific fingerprint signature of each spectrum, then we know what that star is made out of, which is super cool. So how do we draw a Bohr model? Well, before we do that, let's talk a little bit about how we know how many subatomic particles each element has from the periodic table. So let's take a look at carbon here. Carbon on the periodic table has a certain amount of information. The very top number up here is called the atomic number. It's usually the smaller number within the element symbol. Now, the atomic number is the element's identity. Now, if you remember, that's just the number of protons. The number of protons is equal to whatever the atomic number is of that element. And that is always true for that element. Also on the periodic table, we'll see things like the element symbol and the element name. One thing to watch out for is that those might not always match up. Uh, carbon and C make sense, but certain elements like lead and PB might not make so much sense, um, but some of them stem from Latin names or other names of people. Um, so just watch out for element names and symbols that they might not always match up. We need to rely on the periodic table for a lot of this information. The last number, typically the bigger number and always usually a decimal, is called the average atomic mass. This is the average mass of an element now, this is the nucleus of the atom. And if you remember, the nucleus is made out of both protons and neutrons. So part of this number is the proton, and the other part is the neutrons. So we can use this number to determine the number of neutrons. The number of neutrons is just the atomic mass, the masses of a whole. 
minus the atomic number, or we're taking away the protons, and that's how many neutrons there are. Now, this is really true from the periodic table for the average atom. I will tell you that there are lots of different masses of an atom. They're, they're called isotopes, and we'll talk about them on a different module. But if we're just talking about the average atom, we'll just round the atomic number or the atomic mass. The last is the electrons. Now, the electrons are equal to the number of protons. Remember, electrons are negative, protons are positive. So for a normal neutral atom, then those numbers are going to be the same. Again, later we'll learn that the atom might not have a neutral charge at certain points, but for now we're going to treat atoms as neutral. So let's take a little bit of a practice here. Take a look at this carbon atom. Based on this information, let's talk about how many protons, neutrons, and electrons it has. First is protons. You could see the atomic number is six. Now how about neutrons? Well, all we do is take the mass and we're gonna round it to 12 and minus the protons, which is six, which leaves six neutrons left over. Finally is the number of electrons. There are six protons that are positive. Therefore, there has to be six electrons that are negative. Okay, so what about drawing this model? Well, we need to know which energy level those electrons go in. So here are the steps of a Bohr model. Now, I might pause the video right now and, draw, and write these steps down. They might not make a lot of sense at the moment, but it's kind of like playing a board game where you read the directions and you're kind of confused. But once you start playing, it becomes pretty easy. Uh, but the steps over here is first we're going to draw the nucleus, and we do that by knowing how many protons and neutrons there are in there. Next, we'll draw the energy levels, or how many rings that electro that atom has. That's related to the row number or the period number. So over on the left-hand side of this periodic table, you can see that there are seven periods. We're only ever going to have up to seven rings so far. Next, we'll add electrons, and we'll do that by playing what I call the board game method. And I'll show you what that means next, but we move across element squares to help us figure that out. Lastly, we're going to skip elements down in the transition metals. They're just kind of weird, um, and they do weird things. They're not too hard to deal with, and if you're really interested in them, you can come and find your teacher, T-Pop, later, and we'll talk about it. But don't worry about transition metals right now. All right, so let's go ahead and try an example. Let's deal with carbon. Now, if you remember, carbon has a lot of information on the periodic table, and we already know that it has six protons and six neutrons from our previous example. Now, how many rings does it have? So the rings are based on the row number. So carbon is in the second ring or second row. Therefore, it has two energy level orbits. Now, how about those electrons? How do we know where those electrons go? Well, we know that there are six electrons, but do all of them go on the first ring? Do all of them go on the second ring? Is it a split evenly? Well, this is where we're gonna play the board game method. So I'm gonna get my little pawn out, here he is, and we're gonna move it across the periodic table, kind of like a board game. We always start with the first element or the first square on the periodic table. When I put my pawn on that square, I'm going to go ahead and draw an electron in that orbit. So this is the first ring. Therefore, the electron goes in that very lowest energy level on carbon. Now I'm going to move my pawn over to the next square of the periodic table. I'm trying to move towards carbon. Every time I move, I'm going to add another dot on whatever energy level that is. So I added another dot to my, my first ring or the very lowest ring on my carbon atom. All right, where do we go now? Well, we're done with this first row, so I'm gonna move my pawn to the next row or the next energy level. And again, as I do, I'm gonna draw another dot, but this time on the second ring of carbon. And I'm just gonna keep going. I'm gonna keep moving my pawn and drawing a dot, moving my pawn and drawing a dot, and I'll move my pawn and draw a dot. Now I want to get to carbon and I did. Therefore, I'm done drawing this Bohr model for carbon. And that's it, that's how you draw Bohr models. All right, here's a practice for you. Can you draw the Bohr model for magnesium? Here's all the information you need. Pause the video and see if you can figure it out. Did you try it yourself? I sure hope so. Here's the answer. And if you need to work backwards to figure that out, go for it. But here's all the information you need to draw the Bohr model for magnesium. All right, that's the end of the notes. Take a moment to review and highlight key terms. Ponder, write down questions if you need any help, seek answers to those questions, and summarize and answer the essential question. Good luck.